morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the UCLA Anderson Alumni Association's Friday Faculty Chats. I'm Jill Baldoff, Associate Dean Alumni Relations. Today, we're pleased to be joined by Professor Miguel Unzueta, Professor of Management and Organizations and Senior Associate Dean of MBA programs at Anderson. His research covers diversity, bias, and discrimination. Miguel has taken the lead in creating innovation and teaching changes in our MBA programs to meet the needs dictated by the COVID-19 crisis. He earned his PhD from Stanford and joined UCLA Anderson in 2006. He was selected as one of Poets and Quants Best 40 Under 40 in 2011. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping details. You're all on mute, but we welcome your questions. So please utilize the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. Just type in your questions and Professor Unzueta will address them in the Q&A portion of the presentation. Miguel will speak for approximately 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll follow up with 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. Professor Unzueta. Hey everybody, good morning or afternoon, depending on, on where you are. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, first things first, I hope everybody is safe um, and at home, and I hope your families are doing well and holding up in this rather challenging time. Um, today, I was going to talk to you a little bit about um, sort of what the situation is on the ground here at Anderson. So like Joe said, I'm Senior Associate Dean of the MBA programs, and what that means is that I work with our wonderful staff that actually run um, the MBA programs, the various different programs that we have. And I'm sort of the intermediary between them and faculty. So I've really dedicated myself to um, ensuring that communication with faculty is high. Whenever asks a faculty have to get made, I'm the one that goes and makes the ask. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out ways of helping our faculty do their jobs better, uh, be more innovative, be more creative, and uh, just uh, you know, be open-minded to new ways of teaching, uh, not only content-wise, but also delivery mechanism-wise. So you can imagine that when the COVID crisis began, all of this that I just said, that was my mission before COVID. And so when COVID uh, started, it basically just injected uh, what is it, nitro or something like that, uh, to just expedite this process of getting faculty to very, very quickly change up the way they're used to doing things, innovate on delivery mechanism, and also to some extent uh, innovate on the content of our courses. So I've been spending my time uh, working on that. I will say the first probably three or four weeks of this transition were quite stressful and quite difficult. We were all in uncharted territory, but one thing that makes me really happy and proud, not only of our faculty, but also of our students, is that with hard work and intelligence and open-mindedness, we have reached a stasis in which the delivery of our content is now happening in ways that are feeling pretty seamless. I think the competence of faculty at delivery through remote format has increased exponentially. Um, and also I think students' expectations of what uh, remote formats can provide them has also changed and adapted. I think initially students were very pessimistic about what we could actually do with a remote format. But what's come out of this is that there's actually, you know, a Zoom session will never replace an in-person uh, class. Let me just get that out of the way. But there have been some elements of teaching that have actually turned out to be better, and I would argue more modern, by forcing us to go on Zoom or forcing us to go remote. And I'll go over a couple of those in, in just a little bit. Um, so to say the least, it's been a challenging time. Um, we're still in the middle of this storm. I just wanna be very clear about that. So my talk today is about the transformation of business education in the COVID world. But the reality is we're still figuring it all out. I mean, we're, we're at the point right now where we're not even sure what is happening at UCLA in August. Um, the University of California, the, the system um, up in Oakland, there's been no decisions made about how we're delivering uh, content in August and beyond. So we're prepared right now to potentially go back into the classroom. 
we're prepared right now to potentially be in the classroom, but respecting social distancing. We're also prepared to potentially do this all over again, which is teach remotely for um, summer and also for the upcoming quarter. So we don't know what's happening quite yet. We're still trying to figure it all out. Um, and what I've been trying to do, and it's been a little challenging because I think a lot of us are still in crisis management mode. I've been trying to shift from crisis management mode to just trying to think creatively about what all of this stuff that we are learning, uh, all of these remote teaching skills and expertise that we're developing, how are they going to potentially benefit us post COVID? Um, and so I have a few slides here where I just came up with a bunch of different ideas for how I think business education might be different once things go back to, to normal. And I use that word cautiously because I don't know what the new normal is going to be. But let's just say when we can, when we no longer have to be six feet apart, what is going to happen to the way we normally go about doing business? And I'm actually excited about the possibility of um, how things are going to change in the post-COVID world for not only business schools, but I would say education in general. Uh, and I'm going to go over a few of those ideas. And then importantly, since I'm on the call with a bunch of alumni, uh, folks that have been through the MBA program, and now you've been through this um, crisis in your own industries, uh, I'll be curious to hear from you all about what you think we can be doing differently, given the fact that we're all now becoming more and more comfortable with the idea of communicating and delivering content to each other in this format that we're in right now. Um, let me... Uh, all right, so wait, I'm getting my Q&A going here. Um, uh, somebody's asking me about how, all right, I'll get to that later. Somebody's asking me about a class that I teach. Uh, I'll get into that in a little bit later. Um, all right, let me share my screen so we can um, start talking about some of these ideas I've been brainstorming. And then, like I said, I would really like the wisdom of crowds here to take over. And I'd be curious to hear from you all about what you think we can be doing better that maybe I did not identify here in, in my presentation. All right, so let me just sketch out the reality for you all. Um, COVID-19 has, has quite literally turned our world inside out. In a span of two weeks, uh, we at Anderson and frankly, every single university in the country and arguably the world had to convert their traditional in-person classrooms into remote teaching. There are many downsides to this. As you can imagine, there was high levels of stress and dissatisfaction. Students initially were quite dissatisfied and stressed. Um, since I interact with the faculty, since that's my job as senior associate dean, I can tell you that the stress levels and dissatisfaction levels amongst faculty were also incredibly high. So we had uh, two constituents that were very stressed and dissatisfied, both students and our faculty. There was general confusion about how exactly we were gonna be able to do this. Um, we were told that we could not be on campus anymore and faculty who had never taught remotely, who had never taught online, who had never done hybrid, had no idea how they could possibly deliver their content using um, this, this, this more modern technology. And also to be real, I mean, part of the business school experience is in-person interactions. And all of a sudden that was taken away from us. And that's the part that We've been trying to figure out ways to maintain a social connection with one another throughout this process, but we will never fully be able to replace the loss of in-person interactions with Zoom, with whatever delivery mechanism we happen to have. So we'll, we'll get into that in, in a little bit. So in two weeks, we basically converted our entire um, um, uh, experience to being fully online. A lot of things that we just take for granted and that are integral to how we do business were taken away. So suddenly classrooms we could no longer use. We have a brand new building um, in the Anderson complex that is pretty much sitting empty. Uh, new classrooms, new technology, new offices, none of them we could actually use. Like I just said, in-person meetings were completely taken away. Networking opportunities were reduced to interactions on, on the internet. But what I have found interesting, 
And the silver lining that I keep reminding myself of when I start getting overwhelmed by the gravity of the situation at, at, at major universities is that what happened is that by taking away the normal way of doing things, what always happens is that people figure out something else to do. And so uh, whenever I teach about creativity in my classes, that's one of the things that we always talk about is if you remove options from people, people will be forced to come up with something different. And that something different will sometimes be ideas and insights that you never would have come to had you not taken away um, the normal way of doing things. So a common example of this is musicians um, who, let's say they're expert at guitar playing and all of a sudden they commit to making an album where they will not have guitars. And so now you got to figure out ways of actually creating music with all these other instruments that maybe you don't know that well. And maybe you have to skill up, or maybe you realize that there are ways to play that maybe are not particularly expert, but they're unique to what you do. So by taking away options, you end up with a lot of creativity. And that is what has happened um, at Anderson. And I'm going to share some of these uh, uh, points of creativity with you all. And so what I'm hoping happens is that post COVID, we will be able to take some of the things we've learned from the last couple of weeks, the last month and change, combine it with the old way of doing things, and we'll end up with something entirely new. We'll end up with something more streamlined, something more modern, uh, uh, more modern ways of teaching and essentially doing our jobs in ways that are much more in tune with modern day technology. And frankly, with the way that people are getting used to interacting in the present day. All right, let me talk first about faculty innovation. So um, I'm on the faculty here. I've been at UCLA since 2006. Um, I got tenure in 2012. I made full professor in 2018. So I am very familiar with what it's like to be a teacher who is on the tenure track, who is trying to do research while also doing right by our students by teaching uh, as best as I possibly can. So a lot of the things I'm gonna say are gonna be from the perspective of a latter faculty member um, who is teaching and also maintaining an active uh, research program. The first thing that I discovered, and I had run into this uh, at the beginning of my tenure as senior associate dean, I, I was actually talking to faculty about ways of innovating um, their teaching. We were also trying to get faculty who are really good in-person teachers to consider doing hybrid courses for our EMBA program, for example, our executive MBA program. And I won't name names and I won't give you numbers, but I will say that several faculty told me, look, I appreciate what you're doing. I think it's really great that you're trying to innovate and come up with ways of, del of delivering our content in, in ways that are not simply about being in the classroom, but my class cannot in any way be taught online. It requires in-person uh, connection. It requires in-person lecturing. And there's just no way that I could possibly teach my class online. Well, COVID comes around. Suddenly that option is taken away. And you would be shocked to find out how so many of these faculty that told me that they could never transfer their class from in-person to remote suddenly figured out they can do it. And they're actually doing it incredibly well. And I'll be perfectly honest, uh, I'm one of those faculty who initially said that the, co the content I teach cannot be taught online. So I teach a class on negotiations and so much of negotiations involves um, actually doing mock negotiations in class, having students actually interact with each other, negotiate, come up with deals, they report their outcomes, and then we talk about it in class. And that's sort of the magic of doing a class like that. So obviously I need people in their seats. I need people taking on roles in these mock negotiations. I need people negotiating, and I need people to give me outcomes so we can talk about what those outcomes were. So when people were asking me to go online pre-COVID, I said, no way, like I, I just need to be in the classroom. Suddenly I'm teaching in the EMBA program this quarter, in-person is not an option. And what I start realizing is that I can actually have students do a lot of these negotiations on their own time, report all their outcomes online. And if they give me enough time, I can actually sift through all of their deals and outcomes before the class begins so I can structure the conversation. And so every time we meet on live stream on Zoom, we're doing debriefs of the activities 
that they did on their own time. And it requires discipline from students. It requires students uh, taking the class seriously and doing this on their own. But what I'm telling you is after a couple of sessions, I'm finding that this actually works. And so this class that is kind of old school, that requires uh, in-person interaction, it actually did transition to a remote format in a way that sort of shocks me uh, as to how smooth it's been and how good it's been as well. Um, I've also been discovering that a lot of our faculty, many of whom are self-described uh, technophobes or not tech savvy, they're the ones who are actually coming up with all sorts of cool innovations. So I've had a lot of faculty play around with the breakout feature, the breakout um, uh, group feature on Zoom. And they're coming up with all sorts of cool ways of using that effectively. Um, and so I've been very, pleased and surprised by the creativity coming from faculty who don't identify as being particularly tech savvy. You know, they're not sitting in faculty meetings, taking notes on iPads, they're writing on, on pieces of paper, and yet they're the ones coming up with all sorts of cool ways of, of, of teaching with this new technology. The other thing I realized, and this is something that didn't happen in 2008 when we had the subprime mortgage crisis, um, back in 2008, um, business schools across the country were criticized uh, because they did not adapt quickly to explaining what actually happened in the economy when the subprime mortgage crisis actually hit. Um, back in 08, I was still untenured. I was relatively young. Um, and I'll tell you from my memory, we at Anderson were not very good about adapting our teaching to explain what was happening in the economy. I remember talking to students in the spring quarter where I used to teach my core organizational behavior class. And they were telling me that all the classes that you would think would have something to say about how the economy was falling apart said nothing about why the economy was falling apart. And the idea from faculty was, look, we're just trying to teach um, core classes. We're trying to teach um, ideas that are fundamental to business education, to economics, to finance, to marketing. And uh, we're trying to get those things across. And you know, our job is not to try to figure out what's happening uh, in current events. And I, I tell you, our students were very dissatisfied with that. And so I think a lot of us realized from that crisis that pretending that we're not noticing or not adapting our, our teaching material to what's happening in the world, real world, it simply doesn't work. And so after that, a lot of us took seriously the idea of trying to bring in current events to anything that we're teaching. So fast forward from 08 to now. So in 08, we didn't do a great job of adapting our courses to, to the subprime mortgage crisis. What happens here in uh, 2020, a couple of weeks ago, the crisis hits, we suddenly get emails from students telling us that you know supply chains are completely crumbling all over the world. And they're trying to figure out why that's happening. Um, we're also getting emails from students asking us what COVID means for the economy, what COVID means for the world of finance. Um, and we take these concerns to our faculty and we very quickly develop three COVID related courses in a span of two weeks. Now these are not full 10 week courses. These are half uh, 15 hour, five week courses. We have a course uh, developed by Professor Sebastian Edwards uh, on economics and COVID. We have a course that's in development right now by Charles Corbett on supply chains um, and the economy. And Stuart Gabriel uh, is teaching a class on real estate and COVID related matters. So in a span of two weeks, we were able to very quickly draft up and actually implement courses related to what was happening in the economy right now. And I'm not saying that every single faculty member would be asked to do this or could do this, but the fact of the matter is, is that we have a lot of very intelligent and innovative scholars who can do this if given the opportunity. So I think now we realize that speed at course creation is something that we can do in some situations. And this idea that courses require years to be developed it simply doesn't hold anymore. There are some courses that absolutely get better with time. I've developed courses where I start with five week versions and then it takes me two or three years to create the 10 week version that I'm finally happy and comfortable with. That's great. 
I think there's always going to be a space for that kind of slow, deliberate uh, process of creativity. But what also needs to happen sometimes is that we need to be able to translate what we know as scholars, what we know as academics, to help students understand what's happening right now. And the fact that we had three courses created in two weeks to help us understand the impact of COVID on the economy, it frankly, it makes me very proud and it makes me feel like we are doing right by our students by actually helping them see how all the things we know from research, from knowledge acquired by hundreds of years of research on the economy can be applied to what's happening right now. So that's one lesson. Uh, we can actually create courses rather quickly. Um, and I think a lot of these courses will have legs after this is over. They might become something something else after this, this crisis is over. Um, we also now have an entire generation of faculty who were kind of, you know, their feet were kind of, uh, put in the fire a little bit, but all of us had to learn how to do this. And so now everybody on the faculty knows how to teach remotely. And I'll tell you, you go back four months when I was looking for teachers to teach in hybrid or when the executive education program was looking for teachers to teach remote classes to uh, international programs, they basically had maybe 10% of the faculty to choose from. And now all of us know how to do this. So I think that's an incredible opportunity for us to figure out how to best deploy our faculty and their expertise into all these different types of, of programs. I also think it's gonna help us connect to a younger generation that sort of grew up online, even though us and people older than me did not. Um, I'm proud to say I still belong to the generation that remembers what it's, what it's like to not have internet at all. So, and I think I'm probably the last generation of people that can say that uh, or part of that generation. Um, another thing that, that we are learning is that there are actually some elements of teaching that are better when done remotely. So we've been experimenting and discovering ways of using crowdsourcing to benefit the classroom experience. So we have a lot of faculty who are getting very good at developing in-class polls, doing word clouds, doing all sorts of cool uh, um, technological assessments of what the class is thinking. Um, we also have some faculty who are using uh, uh, programs like Slido to figure out ways of crowdsourcing questions for speakers, right? So in Slido, you type in questions that you want to ask a speaker, and then um, your classmates can vote up or vote down questions. And so what we're learning is that we're able to take advantage of the wisdom of the crowd, given these new technological tools, and what's happening is that um, in-class conversation is actually getting streamlined. Um, faculty are finding it easier and quicker to get to the main point in case discussions. And we're actually finding that there's less fumbling around in, in the classroom. And so there's a, a, a greater sense of efficiency and a more kind of focus on class conversation that wasn't always the case when you're in person and you never know what somebody's going to say. Uh, I mentioned earlier breakout rooms and Zoom. Uh, when used appropriately, those have been quite useful. I have one faculty member who is having students go into breakout rooms. He gives them questions to discuss. He gives them, say, 15 minutes to discuss the question. Then he asks one member of each breakout room to email him a summary of their discussion. He then takes a few minutes to read all of those emails. And when they reunite as an entire class in the live stream, he's able to call in on the teams that came up with the coolest, most innovative ideas. So again, it's, it's allowing faculty to sift through a lot of what otherwise would be considered noise in a classroom setting, and we're able to get to those important teaching lessons a lot sooner. Um, I'm also hearing from students that um, quantitative courses that are now being recorded, they're finding a great deal of value in that and that now you can sort of pause, rewind and really try to get your head around whatever formula or, or whatever it is you're trying to figure out in these quantitative courses versus doing it live, which if you miss something, it's just gone and you got to figure it out after class. So students are actually finding it uh, quite useful. Now, there are some elements of remote teaching that are not going away. Um, our first, our number one priority is to come back to the classroom, to do it safely, of course, but we do wanna come back to the classroom. 
I am not saying that remote teaching will ever replace the in-class experience. Uh, we have now lots of data finding that MOOCs, uh, what is it, massive online courses like Coursera, for example. Um, UC actually tried to do cross-campus MOOCs a couple of years ago where there was, for example, a stats class taught at UC Davis that could be taken by UCLA, by Berkeley, by Santa Cruz students. What UCLA found is that the completion rate for those online classes, which were basically asynchronous videos and recordings, the completion rate was under 5%. They were abysmal failures. So the idea that we could simply record a bunch of lectures and have that replace what it's like to actually be in a classroom, that simply doesn't work. The Coursera model will never replace what universities will actually do. There are elements of that model that can be adapted in ways that are creative, in ways that will complement the in-class experience. But I strongly believe that in-person can never be replaced by a fully recorded online version. Now, a live stream can replace or at least help complement some aspects of what we're doing. So a couple of ideas I had about how we can use live streaming to our benefit. One issue that we always have at Anderson is that because we're on a quarter system, it disadvantages our students who are going into summer internships. Um, uh, and internships tend to operate on semester schedules. And so what ends up happening is the last two weeks of the spring quarter, we have students who are torn between going off to their internships or staying, completing their first year in the MBA program. Well, one thing we might be able to do now is have every class in the spring quarter designate the last two weeks to be taught remotely, to be live streamed, um, to have some kind of hybrid um, um, component to allow students to depart early for their internships and not feel like they're falling behind. So they'll be able to do both things, both complete their first year education and also begin their internships on the schedule that most other schools can abide by because they're on semester systems, not quarters. Um, there's a lot of new content coming out from case publishers like Harvard Business Publishing and Ivy and a bunch of other ones that we use that are actually designed to be delivered online. So, you know, this is not to say that old school paper cases are going away. Those are still there and they're very important, but there's been a lot of newer cases developed that are really meant to be taught online with either a simulation or some kind of interactive component. And I'll tell you, in-person faculty have been shying away from that because it gets very clunky to get people to pull out computers and class and go on the internet and do all that. It's just kind of a weird thing to do. But now that we have this expertise in teaching remotely, we can plan better for those kinds of activities perhaps have one or two sessions throughout the quarter be taught fully outside of the classroom. And we'll be able to update our course content and develop more modern ways of getting some of these teaching lessons across. Um, office hours can also be delivered remotely now. Um, so we don't have to have faculty sitting in their offices at sort of awkward times at which nobody shows up. Now we can have office hours set up, say after traffic, after dinner, at nighttime, I think that would really benefit our FEMBA students, for example, if we can do office hours in the late afternoon or maybe nighttime or on weekends. And now it's so much easier to do that because we all essentially can beam in using Zoom, using live streams to talk to people, to interact with students. And this could be both for faculty and for TAs. Um, I'm already finding this. I have several faculty who are telling me that getting guest speakers has been um, so much easier now, I think, because a lot of guest speakers are sitting in their homes like the rest of us. Um, but I think going forward, we're going to be much better positioned to ask high profile guest speakers to just zoom into our classes and talk to our students for 30 to 45 minutes. Um, one thing that students really enjoy, something that I've done a few times, is I actually bring in protagonists from cases to speak to students. And so that's kind of cool, right? Because you read the case and then you hear from the person that the case was written about. And now we'll be able to do that because we're able to access the protagonist regardless of where they happen to be located, right? So we can get an East Coast person to zoom in and actually talk to our classes. And I think that's gonna be really exciting. Um, another aspect that I think could be interesting is we um, can expand our connection to the international business community by having students do virtual site visits those of you who remember your AMR projects at Anderson, maybe your AMR project was an overseas client 
Well, you can do a lot more connection now with your client before you ever set foot on an airplane. And I think that's something that now the technology is cut up, cut up, and also our comfort with this technology has also caught up and will allow us to, to be much better at connecting with people um, in the international business community. A couple other smaller ideas, um, orientation could be done completely remotely. So students don't have to come to LA in August, right? So, you know, that's gonna save students a month in rent. It'll allow students to start their um, leases for apartments on a more traditional UCLA schedule. So maybe that'll, that'll save some money and it'll allow us to deliver orientation um, fully online. We can also do live stream boot camps now before students ever come to campus. So right now we do have some quantitative sort of math oriented boot camps that are done completely using asynchronous videos and recordings. Now we can do live stream because we all know how to do that. So we can do a lot of that before people ever get to campus so that students can now really hit the ground running the second they get here and the second they start taking um, the main uh, portion of their MBA coursework. Um, business schools throughout the country are trying to figure out non-MBA master's programs to create and develop. Um, so we're talking like analytics, uh, master's in financial engineering, things like that. I think that the, the door has been blown wide open for these non-MBA master's programs to be created that could be 100% online. These are programs that are a bit more technical in, in, in nature. Um, they're less intensive on the networking side than MBA programs. So I think these might actually be amenable to a fully online component with maybe 20% in person. We'll have to figure that out. But I think now we know that we can do a lot of these things that will not compete directly with our MBA offerings. And then also thinking about our connections with alumni, something that business schools um, throughout the country are talking about is a way of ensuring lifelong education for our alumni. And so one thing that, that I think is quite possible is not only hosting talks like this one, where people can call in and, and um, see what's happening at the business school, hear from speakers, hear from academics, um, hear from uh, uh, business people uh, of whatever it is they're talking about. But I think we can also, if we can figure out how to do this, I think we can now do virtual auditing for classes, right? The, the, the issue with auditing has always been that we're limited in classroom space, but now if we're doing things virtually or if a class is being live streamed while it's being taught in person, we could potentially let in a select number of people to take these classes remotely. And I think that would be a great way of staying connected with our alumni by letting people come back to Anderson, essentially doing so virtually, sitting in, on internet-based classes, sitting in on live streams, and really reconnecting with that classroom experience. So I think these are just some of the ideas that um, have been circulating, certainly in my own mind. Um, like I said, we're still in the middle of figuring out what all of this means. We're still trying to figure out what the biggest changes are gonna be post COVID, but I'm trying to take time right now to just think about what good can come of this. Um, and this is not to minimize the, the, the terror and the, the horrors happening around the world because of COVID, but when I'm trying not to get caught up in those kinds of thoughts, I'm trying to figure out ways of coming up with ideas now that might help us down the line do what we do better. Um, all right, let me look through the Q&A here and uh, um, see what's going on here. Is UCLA suspending, this is Todd Lawrence, the usual approval process for introducing new courses, faculty senate review and approval. Um, I don't know about UCLA, but the way new courses um, happen at Anderson is they have to go through a curriculum subcommittee of which I am a member of. Um, and that curriculum subcommittee, we've basically been on call whenever uh, to meet and to work through syllabi and provide approval for classes. So we've been working, we haven't relaxed any of our um, um, processes for actually um, approving classes, but we have figured out ways of expediting them. So there hasn't been anything on the Anderson side that would suggest that we're allowing sort of bad classes happen. We're just expediting the approval process uh, right now. 
Um, are there any plans to expand number of classes slash reduction in student per class to reduce risk of transmission? Um, the answer is yes, that is being talked about. Um, like I said earlier, we are, um, we are potentially, we're preparing basically for being back in person, for being fully online, for doing a hybrid version of every single program, or having some kind of social distance version. So we have been trying to figure out which classrooms could be used for a social distance version of an in-classroom experience. And we're just trying to get prepared, but we don't know what's happening yet because we are waiting from word from uh, the University of California system to let us know what's happening. Um, so how are you incorporating what will be the new norm into the curriculum? So I think that's what's gonna be really interesting, right? I'm trying to figure out ways to collect all the innovations that are happening and figure out a way to make sure that now these practices get spread out throughout the faculty. So thanks for that question, uh, Josh. Um, Ella says she misses uh, negotiations. I'm glad to hear that, Ella. Uh, uh, I'm glad you liked the class when you took it. Um, how alumni can practice and learn techniques in negotiations. Um, I'm happy to provide some resources. If you wanna email me, there's actually a bunch of um, negotiations materials that are out there that are not behind paywalls. I'd be happy to, to send that to you. So just drop me an email and I'm happy to, to send that off to you. Um, okay, so let me stop the share here. Um, are there any, let's see, I'm looking at the webinar chat. Are there any, uh, actually, well, looking at my final slide, I mean, we have a bunch of people on the call who have been through business school and you've also been through this crisis. And so I'm curious if any ideas have come to mind uh, with you all about how all of these new techniques of communication that we're all learning and becoming good at, how they could be used um, in a business school curriculum. So I'm curious if anybody out there had any ideas and uh, Jill, I think we're, we're going to open up the microphone potentially to try something new. We are. There is a raise hand feature. So if you want to participate, just click on the raise hand feature. We will unmute you and we're going to try and have a dialogue. So this is the big experiment about um, virtual learning. So let's have a go. This is pretty much what it's been like for the last four weeks, by the way. We're all just experimenting and we're failing and we're succeeding. And, you know, that's how we're learning. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Go ahead, Olivia. Good morning. Such a great idea to share this. Uh, and uh, I can't see how many people are on the call, but uh, I, I, I think, I hope uh, this was well attended because it was well, well worth it. So thank you, first of all. Um, well, th thanks for calling in. I appreciate it. Yeah, and one, one of the things that uh, we noticed um, in our virtual meetings is the inertia or the reluctance to use um, some of the drawing capabilities that uh, tablets have. Yep. I'm wondering if you've seen um, if you've seen that feature collaboration in real time using multiple inputs from multiple people being being used effectively in the classroom. So sketching on a whiteboard or maybe editing uh, the same document at the same time, yeah. uh, things that you would try to do perhaps in person on, on a physical whiteboard or on, on a piece of paper, but um, we, we, we seem to, to not be very um, comfortable exploring that, that type of collaboration. Yeah. Um... We did have, um, so this was over spring break. We had, um, we had a training uh, led by Professor John Mamer, who's uh, one of our stats professors and also a, he's, he's been at Anderson for, for a long time. And he was teaching all of us how to connect our iPads or Microsoft surfaces to our computers to create essentially a digital whiteboard on which you could write. And this was particularly useful for people who were teaching you know, more formulaic, more quantitative type courses. So yeah, that has been uh, used. I had some faculty struggle with that. And so uh, what we did is we bought them a USB document camera so they could 
essentially replace the document cameras that sit in the classroom where they could write on a piece of paper and just have it projected. Um, but I'm trying to move everybody towards being comfortable and hooking up their iPads and their tablets so they can actually draw, do formulas, write on their slides, all that kind of stuff. So that works well when you get the technology to work. So I know it is something that at least the quantitative uh, teachers have been trying to implement in their teaching. Got it. Thank you. Miles Taub, do you have a question? I do. I'm curious how students are interacting with potential employers right now. Are they going through a video interviewing process and are you seeing offers get pulled just given the shakeup in the economy? Um, so yeah, uh, everything is switched to, to this type of interaction, right? Everybody's doing online interviews and things like that. We have had a couple of um, summer offers pulled we have been pleasantly surprised that it hasn't been like a rampant thing. It's only been a few here and there. Um, a lot of companies have um, honored their offers. Um, they're switching the parameters and you know what a summer internship is gonna mean potentially. Some of them have actually switched the internship to be something that could be done remotely. Um, so some of it has happened. There have been a few offers pulled, but it hasn't been anything rampant. Like it's not a crisis level by any means. Um, and yeah, interactions have switched to being completely online. Um, fortunately, um, a lot of our students had already finished the interview process for internships when this hit. So I think a lot of them were able to do the selection process in person and only a few had to resort to online. But yeah, it, it switched to online and fingers crossed, um, majority of our offers have been honored so far. Ashish Gol. Ashish, do you have a question? All right, we're gonna to move to Raquel Brown. Hi, really like what you're doing and what you've shared. Excellent, excellent. I One of the learnings I've had is, is not having, not having oh, oops maybe i um, did something here i'm echoing not having people do what i'm doing which is have their camera off um because when you have the camera off it's just a much more collaborative experience i happen to be cooking quiche so i have my camera off <laughs> um but that's one thing that i've found um, in the in the workplace is that when when people have the camera off it's a different experience so, so you're saying having the camera on is is the preferred yes it's more collaborative because then you could you're actually interacting so it, it it's not as much like face to face but it's far beat just the, the voice yeah so we um We've had to switch all our faculty meetings to, to online, obviously, and we require uh, the camera to be on just to ensure that, you know, the people that are supposed to be there are the ones who are in fact there. Also, when I teach, I don't make it mandatory, but I strongly encourage students to keep the camera on. It helps me when I'm teaching to put it on, um, what's the mode called when you have everybody's face up? Um, it yeah, helps like the gallery. Yeah. yeah, the gallery view. It helps me simulate what it's like to actually look at people in, in, in an auditorium, for example, when I'm teaching, when I'm talking. Uh, and also, I, I do think it, it, makes, it makes you a little more accountable knowing that, you know, somebody could be watching you while you're, you know, surfing the internet or petting your cat or whatever it is you're doing. Right. Um, so yeah, yeah, that, that's definitely been a good practice. That, that helps. I'm curious. I'm curious why it's not mandatory in the classroom as it would be if it was if we were in the classroom. Yeah, so we, we've had some issues at the UCLA level where we were, um, we were cautioned about making it mandatory just given the fact that there are some equity concerns, right? And so yeah. um, Calvin just uh, posted that it could be an issue if your Wi-Fi speed isn't great. So that's true, okay. if your upload speed is terrible, you, it's, it's gonna potentially mess up the entire call and the audio. Um, okay. At the undergraduate level, we're also realizing that there are, are some students who unfortunately are not in the best 
most isolated spaces. So they might be living with their families. You have a lot of people in a small space. It's hard for them to have their camera on just given all the activity happening in the background. So, you know, it's something that we can't force everybody to do, but if possible, we do encourage the camera to, to be on. Got it, appreciate it, thank you. It looks like Andrew Yoon has his hand raised. Hi there, yep, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks for this, this was a very insightful. Um, I just had a quick question. On, uh, I was wondering if there has been any uh, thought or analysis around um, impact to uh, actual emission costs by moving to a more uh, virtual environment, uh, either in, in the short term or long term. And if that's something that's, um, you know, there's been any analysis or, or thought around. There's been conversation about that, um, but we haven't done any actual analysis on potential cost savings or things like that. Um, I will tell you that right now we're undergoing a strategic review. We go through one of these every five years. And you know it's sort of good timing that this started, it just started three weeks ago, actually. Um, uh, Tony Bernardo, our Dean, kept it on schedule, um, regardless of what's happening with COVID and with remote teaching, partly because it's more important now than ever to come up with good strategy looking forward. So that's definitely going to be part of the, the strategy committee's uh, assessment is what are the potential cost savings due to not having to have people fly into campus, be there in person, all that stuff. But it's too early yet. We don't know what the numbers are. Sure, that makes sense. Thanks. Rodrigo Lara. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, Miguel, thank you for our explanation. I just wanted to know if, um, uh, do you know if you had people dropping off the course because of this new situation, the new format, or if the number in the admissions are lower than it, it's you usually is? Yeah. Um, so there has been a industry-wide trend where MBA applications in general across the country have actually been dropping. And that seems to be holding again. We're actually seeing fewer applications this year than we did in the last. As of now, we don't have any evidence that admitted students are, are dropping or you know not accepting our offers. We're on pace right now to fill up um, um, five sections of our full-time program and four sections of our FEMBA program. So things have sort of held up. Um, anecdotally, I have talked to a few students who tell me that they're gonna wait it out another year um, to wait for things to go back to normal, fingers crossed. But there hasn't been any sort of large scale exodus from the MBA program that I've seen. We're currently on pace to fill up our sections uh, for next year's class. So fingers crossed that it holds, but um, the data is suggesting that we, we have a very good chance at hitting our numbers. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rodrigo. Miguel, that looks like it's it for hands that were raised. I don't know if you wanna look at your, see if there are more questions yeah. in the Q and A. Um, let me see, let me see. Yeah, there's a lot of questions about the, the finances of this. And, and what I'll say is that um, we do have uh, a committee looking at the finances of, of everything that's happening. I'm not even gonna try to go there. That, that's completely, well, not completely, but that is outside of my purview as senior associate dean. So anything I'll say is probably just gonna create consternation and confusion. That said, uh, that is something that our dean who is a finance professor and members of the Anderson School are, are looking at. Um, uh, somebody's asking if the first semester in September will be remote. Um, we don't know yet is the answer. Uh, that was Andrew's question. We're still waiting on word from the University of California system about what's happening. Um, so technologies that we're using for distance learning. So mainly we've been using um, Zoom. That's what we're under contract with. 
Um, drawbacks, um, yeah, I mean, most of us, if you were to ask any faculty member, would you rather be in the classroom or online? The answer is we wanna be in the classroom. It's just that simple. Um, it's harder to have, get conversation going. It's harder to just know how the class is feeling by looking at them. So you have to do things like, you know, momentary check-ins and polls and things like that. So, you know, polling features and things like that are cool, but would I rather just be able to ask the class how we're doing? Do we need a break? Does did that make sense? I would rather do that in person any day. Uh, but I think we're realizing now that in small quantities, live streaming can complement what we do um, in the classroom. Um, yeah, changes to admissions. Um, we don't know yet. I mean, one thing I will say about, about sort of the impending, what is looking like it's gonna be a recession is that the general trend is that MBA applications tend to rise when the economy is, is struggling. So that could be a situation where the number of applications across the industry rise. We don't know yet, it's still too early to tell, but you know, looking a year or two down the line, we might actually see um, a ton of applications to the program. Whereas this year they were still dropping across the industry. Um, somebody also asked if um, deferred admission was possible. So Anderson is not allowing um, uh, admissions or acceptances to be deferred. We do make it very easy to reapply. Um, so if students get in, but they don't wanna come this year, the reapplication process is very easy. It's, it's sort of a cut and paste kind of thing. Um, so that, that is how we're trying to handle that. Um, um, managing student expectations, that's a great uh, question. Um, the question is, can you comment on UCLA's approach to managing student expectations? I know at Anderson, we have been meeting weekly with student leadership. We are um, just taking concerns uh, that are happening. We're trying to be as responsive as we possibly can. If classes are identified that are struggling with the remote teaching uh, delivery, we are intervening as soon as possible. I've had a number of very awkward conversations with my colleagues, but they need to be had because we need to make sure that we're doing as best a job as we possibly can. And the fact that we've not, that a lot of us have not taught online before, that's not gonna be an excuse for delivering an inferior product uh, right now. So we've been trying really, really hard to intervene with faculty who are struggling. Our IT team has been magnificent. I mean, it feels like they're working 24 hours a day. They've been answering questions left and right. They've been helping faculty who are struggling. So we've been talking to our students, we've been talking to student leadership, and we're trying to address comments as they come up, comments and concerns as they come up. And that's the way we've been trying to manage uh, the expectations is just be as transparent and as communicative as we, we possibly can. There's a lot of questions we can't answer because they come down from the University of California system, but we answer everything we absolutely can and we are trying to be as transparent as we possibly can. Um, yeah, somebody's uh, calling me out on uh, saying that, uh, I said we were much more efficient in getting to teaching points and that we're able to kind of get through the noise. As I was saying that, I was actually thinking that uh, in my own classes, sometimes we get to the most interesting insights when we go in a slight slight tangent. So I think I, I probably overstated the, the benefit of efficiency that comes from sort of knowing what uh, breakout groups are talking about and just getting to the teaching points. I think you're right. And I think that's one aspect of the classroom that is missing online. There's probably less room for fumbling around with conversations that kind of go in tangents and that could lead to interesting insights. In its place, you do have much more direct and efficient uh, conversation around teaching points. So, you know, to the extent that we're trying to be interactive, but also efficient and not keep people on these calls for longer than they have to, I think that's a benefit but we are losing that exploration component. So I know Karen uh, Bolin pointed that out and that's a great point. And, you know, frankly, it's what makes classroom teaching so interesting. We're, we're constantly battling 
um, staying on track and also letting the class go in different directions. And I think that's something that is missing from the online experience. And one of the reasons why I think it's so important for us to figure out a way to get, get back into the classroom safely as soon as we can. Uh, let's see, I'm looking through a few other questions, see, see what I can answer. Um, somebody asked if we're looking to expand the number of classes. Um, in general, no, we're, we're not actually offering more classes. Uh, what we are doing is currently this quarter for enrolled students, um, probably about 25% of our classes waived their enrollment caps. So I had some faculty just tell me that they're willing to let in as many students as want to take their classes. A bunch of other faculty said, no, I only want 60 students to, um, to be enrolled, but anybody who wants to audit can. And so what we've seen is that we're no longer really held back by um, classroom space limitations. And we've seen a large number of classes that you previously could not audit suddenly be open for auditing. So I think that's been a, an interesting development. And something that, again, if we figure out a way to sort of simulcast live classes um, on live stream for our students, we can let people who wanna audit, audit from their personal computers while we have a 50 to 60 person classroom for a live class. So I think that could be a really cool use of technology. We're already talking about upgrading our camera technology in the classroom. We've talked about potentially hiring um, cameramen and women to actually be in the classroom to create a more professional feed of an in-class um, classroom experience. So I think that's gonna be an interesting direction that our uh, live classes go in, in, in trying to create a high production um, um, version of a live stream of an in-person class. I think that could be really interesting and also a great way for people to audit classes that they either don't wanna take for a grade or the professor will not allow uh, that many people to take it for a grade. Well, Professor Unzueta, thank you so much. We're just about at the end of our time for our Friday faculty chat, but we really appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts and insights with us. Lots of good questions, lots of good answers, lots of good food for thought. So thank you very much. I appreciate it, Jill. Alums. Thanks so much. Oh, no, thank you. To all of our alums who participated, we will be sending you a link, which will have um, a link to the video of today's session if you wanted to go back and take a look at any of the questions that came up. Um, next Friday, we have a faculty chat, but the faculty member is going to be Dean Tony Bernardo in a town hall. So please do sign up for that. He will take um, questions and he will have panelists there to answer some questions about the MBA programs, both from FEMBA, EMBA, and the full-time MBA. So please join us for that. We'll see you next week. And in the meantime, um, please stay healthy, stay safe out there. Bye-bye and thank you.